call it the fair shot agenda. You'll determine whether it is or not. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. All right, don't laugh at my glasses. Uh, they, they, we've had this whole conversation. The contacts are in, these glasses, I don't know where they, I found them. I can't find my others, so I'm just getting ahead of it for you. So you're not sitting there 12 minutes through the show going, what in the heck? Is it the, what? Welcome in. Nice to have you aboard for this, what's today? It's Wednesday, the middle of the week, hump day. We have three state representatives here, all who have their own perspectives on what's called the fair shot agenda. And... Uh, You'll determine whether you think it's all fair shot. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm halfway through with them on a thumbs up basis on some of these items, and we'll cover them um, coming up here this evening. So don't go anywhere. Let's check in on what's happening in Washington first, though, real quick. Uh, Donald Trump is moving at warp speed with uh, executive orders and the like. But, of course, voter fraud is at the top of everybody's concerns since Donald Trump made it. One of his concerns yesterday, here's a tweet that shows that, I believe we have that, correct? We do? Yes. Uh, even though it's da 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 ba 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 I will be asking for a major investigation into voter fraud. This is a reaction to yesterday's uh, spout off about three to five million people who he says <laughs> illegally voted. Sean Spicer was beside himself yesterday that he made was he said three to five million people you know cost could have voted illegally based on the studies that he's seen so there you go sean spicer kind of go blah, 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 blah. he doesn't think there's a problem but he can't say it because he's hired by a guy who does think there's a problem who has no proof that there's a problem figure that out in the meantime nelly gorbea is upset she is the secretary of state and she is apoplectic almost with the president, saying it's outrageous that he makes these unsubstantiated comments. A lot of outrage in the city of Providence yesterday. Joe Paolino, the former mayor, gets going on a solution, his own financial solution, to the homeless issue in the city of Providence, and the neighborhood went nuts. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. There's a second headline here, I think, um, and a story that you should see. Not what the former Providence mayor expected. Joe Paolino announced to Eyewitness News Monday that he bought St. Joseph's Hospital in the capital city south side. Taking us on a tour, he said the nine-story structure will be a social service center with long-term housing for 300 homeless people. The news came after months of Paolino's attempts to solve homelessness problems in front of his building downtown. It is obvious that you don't want the homeless in your area. Where Tuesday morning's press conference was supposed to give us more specifics. They're taking all these buildings, all these facilities, facilities from the more affluent communities of our city and they're dumping them on the distressed people of our city. This is a problem. Instead, activists, counselors, a state rep and state senator took the podium, some wanting the project put elsewhere. We have become the dumping ground for the whole state of Rhode Island. And that's not fair. Others simply wanting more input. I was not invited to sit at the table. Governor Raimondo left before speaking, telling Dan York Paolino did not do a good enough job engaging the community. I think I need to have just more dialogue in a better environment. The sitting mayor, Jorge Alorza, said the project won't happen without the community. If the residents aren't behind this project, We're not. We're this not. project is not going to happen. It's tough for them to trust because they've been screwed so many times. And I'm not tone deaf to that. Mm. I got to give Joe Paolino a lot of credit. I was there yesterday and it was uh, quite the scene. Now, I'm, you know, can't be afraid of cat when it comes to public discourse. Uh, but he had a good amount of stamina sticking in there when most would fold up. Actually, there were another half a dozen or so people in the community representing various organizations supporting this project who balked at standing in front of that microphone, in front of that crowd that shouted down Joe Paolino repetitively, Mayor Lorza repetitively, including the governor who said, you know what, I think I'm here just to watch, thank you very much. And after about 40 minutes, she went out the back door uh, having seen enough. She did tell me that she thought that Joe needed to get uh, some work done to market this idea correctly. Uh, we will uh, follow this very important story over the next couple of weeks, and I think there will be some interesting developments. You know, Mayor Lorza has more or less said the community doesn't like it, so I'm not with it. 
I'm not sure that's real leadership. I think that's how you develop a little bit of a rash in your private parts, you know, when you ride the friends too much. You know, one hour you're with Joe Polino, maybe I'll understand it's a great idea. Well, as soon as people yell at you, you're going the other way. Politics. In the meantime, the Fair Shot agenda is going to take hold here at the General Assembly. Here's a headline all about it. Uh, liberal Rhode Island lawmakers introduced the Fair Shot agenda. And Eyewitness News covered the story last week. I stand here today representing all Rhode Islanders who just need a fair shot. A group of House Democrats believe that fair shot relies on four pillars. In the aftermath of the election, I think, I think many people started to realize that there is, there is a large uh, group of Americans who feel that they've been neglected. Representative Greg Amore says those Americans are primarily the working poor and the middle class. He says their fair shot in Rhode Island begins with a fairer tax system, one that reduces the regressive car tax for the middle class. We're going to have to look really closely at where that revenue is going to come from uh, and where in the budget it can come from. Next pillar, a push to allow every worker to take paid sick time. Right now, 41% of private sector workers in Rhode Island have no access to any uh, paid sick days. This piece of legislation would call for every employee to accrue seven sick days in a year. The agenda also calls for a raise in the minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2022, including a first step to $11 this year. I think you will get pushed back, of course. Uh, the minimum wage debate happens every year on the floor here. The fourth item on the agenda, school building repairs throughout the state, which reps say currently price around $1 million. They say funding for the future of education is offering a fair shot for all. All righty, so there's a, a highlight as to what the whole conversation is all about. Uh, Aaron Rugenberg, he's one of the leaders on this. He's from the east side, represents the same district that Gordon Fox used to represent, correct? That's right. Welcome back to the program. Thanks nice for to having see me. You. Um, Moira is the lead troublemaker in the legislature, no doubt, right? I hope not. Sort of. I'd like to You're think. very meek today. I, you I, usually come in gangbusters, tearing the place up. Maybe it's because I was tearing the place it's up the glasses, the show yeah. today. It, it really, is. The glasses it's really intimidating really, they are, Well, they're just dopey. I mean, you just seem you know. so much smarter. I feel like you're going to shoot me down. Well, I'm not intending to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your, in your stuff. Uh, we have the uh, Fair Shot Agenda graphic here, just to remind everybody what uh, some of these concepts are. Do we have that uh, handy? We can put, pop that up, um, and you can see, again, from the package, uh, what the concepts are here. Earn paid sick days, number one. Why don't we just say minimum wage? And those are two things I think Moira is, is, is pretty focused on. The building repairs, education, a lot of, I don't, I don't see where there's any debate on, on a capital improvement program for our decrepit schools. And a fair tax system, well, <laughs> fair is always in the mind of the beholder. Uh, what's your take on this, on, the, on earn paid sick days? Your, your, does your working life uh, advise you on this? Yes, absolutely. I work in the restaurant industry, which is an industry that typically does not have uh, paid sick days, which is very disconcerting for a number of reasons. First of all, um, it really puts people in a position to have to decide between their health and their finances, um, which particularly in the restaurant industry is not a great idea. Um, if you have somebody who's making the decision to go to work based on the fact that they can't miss that one day of pay and are willing to uh, infect other people through you know airborne illnesses that travel especially when you're uh, handling food that's a really big concern um, we did manage to find a way to make it significantly less of a burden on business owners um, in the couple of states where this has already been done small business owners specifically were very concerned that it was gonna um, take a really huge toll on them financially uh, but realized afterwards and came out and said as much that it was a policy that was mostly beneficial, um, that they weren't finding that there were people who were abusing the sick day policy as they had thought there would be, um, and that it really did just uh, provide another level of security for their workers. It's a cumulative earned program, right? Based right, on so the number of hours you work, you accumulate a certain number of sick days. That's right. So it's uh, the legislation we're introducing uh, is designed similarly to the other states around us. Massachusetts has passed this, Connecticut, Vermont, New York, um, where you earn an hour of sick time for every 30 hours you work up until a limit. And so it, it is, it's earned sick time. You don't, uh, obviously there's, there's flexibility for how employers want to handle that, but that's, the, that's sort of the floor that it's setting. 
And again, it's, it's part of this package where we're saying that uh, we want to do whatever we can to make sure that every Rhode Islander has a fair shot at a decent life. Right now, we're seeing, we're hearing it from our constituents, way too many Rhode Islanders feel like they're running in place, they're working longer, harder hours, but they don't feel like they're getting ahead. And there's a belief, in, and we would argue it's a, it's a correct belief, um, that the economic and the political deck is stacked against a lot of folks in favor of big corporations and the most well-connected and, and the wealthiest. And so what we're saying is let's put together a package that really prioritizes the needs of folks who too often are not prioritized. Let's make sure that we're fighting for every Rhode Islander. Including this ongoing, incessant, annual discussion on a minimum wage. When we come back, we'll tackle that. Stay with us. Yes, your state house, where all the decisions are made. We have two of three guests here so far, uh, Representative Moira Walsh, who's brand new, and Representative Aaron Rugenberg, who is now in his second term, correct? That's right. Yes. Um, part of this, uh, I don't know, should I characterize you as the progressive left of the General Assembly right now? I mean, I would argue, and I think you can see from the breadth of the support, there were 26 reps who've, who've said we're going to prioritize this package. That, Meaning uh, the fair, the fair, the fair agenda, shot agenda. Fair shot. That this isn't really left or right. I mean, we 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 saw in this last election that that gets scrambled a lot. There's a lot of folks who feel left behind, and they might come from a more conservative bent. I, I got to give you that one. I, 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 I don't quarrel with that. I think you're right. I think I think this election season has really crossed a lot of lines. There's there's we got a president who's been elected that um, it's a day to day follow. Um, he's a Republican who has many conservative Republicans freaking out. Uh, we have uh, agendas that uh, used to be a Republican agenda, now are Democratic agendas, and vice versa on a national basis. And it's awful difficult, I think, to follow exactly who's ideologically predictable. Well, and right I think now. Donald Trump appealed to folks who felt left behind. Now, I, I argue that that was a, I'm sure it's a con job. I'm sure Bernie was your left behind guy. I, because because I think he was putting forward an agenda that's actually going to help folks who feel who are left behind instead of creating an administration full of people from Wall Street and billionaires. But people are feeling left behind, and we need to show that we're fighting for the solutions that are going to actually help working families. So the, the, the sick leave, uh, sick days, uh, they, they do, do some more reading on that. The General Assembly will be you know pouring through it. The second item on this fair shot agenda is the minimum wage. Governor Raimondo has said that she wants to pop it up to 1050. That was in her. State of the State address last week, $15 minimum wage, when, what, who? So the plan is $15 by 2022. So no one's saying $15 next year. Uh, all the research shows that uh, when you ramp up minimum wage, the, the um, disruption to businesses, et cetera, um, doesn't really happen. It's, it's about doing it gradually. So what we're saying is let's be ambitious. Let's put us a line in the sand that no one, no Rhode Islander who's working full time should live in poverty or on the verge of poverty. And so let's, let's get to 15 by 2022. And that starts with a significant uh, increase this year to $11. Look, I, I, there's two things. One, can we at least get a two or three year track on this? So 2020, maybe we can do the math and, make, and feel good about that. I am so tired of this legislature coming back and arguing this every year. At least Connecticut and Massachusetts have Put a program out. You know, mass is now at 11. You know, 1050 hides underneath it. You can talk about the competitive issues there, but we cannot year after year have a zero-based argument on this whole thing. Businesses need to be able to budget and plan. I agree completely. When I talk to business owners, the thing that they say the most is, "We need predictability. We right. need to know what's happening." A absolutely. So let's let's plan five years out today, this year, at let's a buck say a, you're going to know where we're about going, a buck a year. and let's make sure that every Rhode Islander has a living is, wage. Is that where you are? Of course, think, you're a waitress and you've got a whole different ball game there. I would like to, to you know, mention that if we are going to be uh, addressing the minimum wage, as we have collectively discussed, is, is a wise decision, that we are, we would be remiss to leave out the tipped workers once again. Um, it took 30 years for us to get the $1 raise in Rhode Island. Uh, but that isn't going to mean anything if we let the wages stay stagnant. Does it affect your tips, by the way? No, no. That's when we first met, was your, your advocacy minimum. for that. Um, so you, you've seen an income increase because of this? Yes, absolutely. Uh, this notion, though, and we could go on all day, 
but I, I have to tell you, I, I find this so intellectually dishonest, this conversation about working full time, no one should ever be in poverty. It depends on what you're doing, man. I mean, not everybody who's working full time, including a lot of young people who are not there to earn household livings, uh, may be working full time. I think, it, I, I think that's an argument that needs to be thrown in the can. Give me some others. But this notion that just because you're working full time means that you should not be in poverty, I think is specious on its, on its, on its face. Why? Because not every gig that you might end up full time is a household earning gig. Not every family ought to be born based on people with minimum wage earning capacity. There's a little thing called you want preparation and you want businesses to be prepped for minimum wage increases, I'm with you. I'd like people who make babies to be prepped, to have the money in the bank to be able to afford them. I mean, this, is this notion that families are suffering because they're working on minimum wage, hey, memo, don't have babies if, you have, if you're if making the minimum wage. Well, I think that's, <laughs> I've got some problems with that statement, but I'm sure you let's, do, but God, well, let's put families aside, minimum wage right now it's it's not a living wage for anyone. The, you can't you can't live and a not decent everybody life on who the earns a minimum wage is and, in, and it has the way, responsibility to 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 others. I mean, listen. So, just out of curiosity, um, what is the line for people who deserve to feed their families tonight and people who don't? Just because obviously, like, there's a certain number of kids where you don't deserve to be able to feed your children on minimum it's wage. It's not a right? question about so whether you deserve to feed your children. Children who are here present a certain dilemma. The rhetoric that anybody working full time should not be in poverty is specious because there are people who are not prepared for the families that they have who are working full time who fall below the poverty level. And what we, and what we do is we make excuses for that repetitive dynamic. I, so one, one thing that is I worthwhile say pointing your out, one thing that's worthwhile pointing out is that uh, when we talk about people who are working for minimum wage, by and large, it's not the high school student. People like to say it's the high school student. By and large, no, it's a, it is, it's, um, it is adults. It's someone with a family. So that's that's a reality. And you know, the economic data is pretty clear that we all do better when we all do better, right? If people have more money in their pockets, they're able to go out, spend it in the local economy. It circulates here in Rhode Island versus. Well, this is. This conversation obviously needs more time, so we'll put you on the radio on, and where we can spend some more time at 3 o'clock on WPRL um, because we've got another rep who has some issues on taxation along with this fair agenda plan. He deserves some time. you have a last word on this other than eyeballing me? I think that uh, anybody who works full-time should not be you're, living in poverty. You're, you're sticking with it. I am. Hey. All day. You're right to do so. We shall be right yeah. back. Stay with us. All righty, uh, Representative Jean-Philippe Barros from Pawtucket has joined us. Do you want part of that argument? You want to move on to taxation? Surely, I think, you know, um, I think we should move on. Oh, to welcome uh, to the program. Uh, what is your you. thought on the fair tax agenda? And this, well, obviously you've got the school buildings. Uh, can we stipulate that our schools are in terrible, terrible shape across the board with some exceptions and that we need a capital repair program of substantial nature? I, I'm with you completely on that, yes? All Absolutely. right, we got Absolutely. some consensus. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I don't know why, you know, by the way, I'm, I'm neutral on the sick days. The minimum wage, I just want to plan. Yep. Number three, I'm with you. And number four, what's the tax program? So, yeah, I think, you know, the tax program right now would basically, you know, going through the, the car tax issue. The car tax issue is very it's an aggressive tax, and the folks that actually have been Amen. used to I've been arguing it. against it for since the day I got here. But what is your plan? Do you like the speaker's plan, or do you like the governor's plan? Well, certainly, I think currently I like the speaker's plan better. Certainly, I think yeah, you know, I'm for the total phase out of the of the of the, of the car you tax. You realize that in, in 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 spirit, I'm with you. But do you realize the mechanics and the difficulty in just phasing this thing out at forty million dollars a pop each year over five years? and what it's going to do disproportionately in terms of fairness when it comes to other property tax. We need property tax reform along with car tax reform Absolutely. in the state. Absolutely. Okay. I, I agree with that completely. Uh, all of the, the, the rankings of states, et cetera, that, that, that seem to imply Rhode Island has um, burdens for people, it really comes down to the property tax. That's, that's right. our biggest challenge right now. And so what we're saying in the Fair Shot agenda, right now there's not a specific, um, a specific Bill, we're, we're talking to folks and figuring that out, but we're, we're laying out some principles that uh, we should be working to uh, make sure that the folks who can least afford to pay the biggest burdens are not being asked to, and the folks who can 
uh, most easily afford to pay their fair share are being asked to do so. One of the arguments about lowering, you know, lowering and eliminating the car tax is that renters get a freer ride, all pun intended, that those who are paying their property taxes. Now, obviously, rent is passed through by landlords and all that kind of thing when they're paying property taxes. Um, I just think that we need a more thorough and comprehensive property tax analysis before we do what we do. In lieu of that, I don't know why we can't repeat the formula that our neighbors in Massachusetts have had, Correct. which is get rid of the Vehicle Value Commission, which is insane, take the retail MSRP, and then do a, a 90, 60, 40, 20, 10 depreciation schedule at $25 per thousand, have everybody in each Pay town the paying the same, same amount of right. money. Absolutely. I think right. Do we, we agree on that? To have fairness across the board, yeah. that, that's, that's what we're, we're saying Correct. should be in the conversation. But here's what I'm saying. You can't do that until you change the property tax formula because those adjustments will be massive and create incredible inequities when it comes to state subsidy of communities on Correct. the property tax. Well, again, you so give, I'm just saying you, you can't them, do this in a vacuum. No, no. But you, you give them time enough to actually figure out that in five years' time, this thing is going to be phased out. So they're going to have to figure out how they're going to pay for it. You're talking about the communities? Correct. I, I just think that, and again, we have to expand this conversation to a longer forum at some point. You guys have got to think that you cannot deal with, deal with this car tax in a vacuum. It's, I agree. There's too much impact on the property taxes and the, and, and, the, and the formulas are way out of whack. Absolutely. When you equitize the car tax, which I'd like to see, you also have to do the other. In Massachusetts... And the, yeah, the state needs to, to step up to help. They, oh, I don't I think mean, it it's, a state, it's a state... Absolutely. I don't think the solution lies at City Hall's. Right. I think the right. solution lies with exactly. you guys in, in the State House. For maybe, a different, maybe a different type of uh, income tax, a broad-based income tax, which actually compensate for and maybe bring in some additional revenue and then phase it out. Here's right. the thing. Most people want lower taxes across the board I hope that is something that is in your agenda when you're when you're thinking about this. Well, we're saying that I mean, you you look back, and not the only, but one of the reasons that we we have such a reliance on the property tax is a number of years ago we cut the income tax, particularly at the highest levels, and that right. resulted in a big cut to state aid to cities and towns, and and so cities and towns were figuring out, okay, what do we do? How do we deal with this? And so mm, things sure. like property tax and car tax. I think went the, up. I think the great so recession had a lot to do with that. Sure, and it happened. It happened at similar times, so it's it's connected. Correct. But what we're saying is, we need to put equity in this conversation. We need to be saying that folks uh, at the at the top of the income bracket need to be paying their fair share as well. Last word. No, I think folks. I mean, with certainly the income tax has come down from nine, it was a nine point whatever to five point one now. So obviously, the, those who have should be able to fair, pay their fair share. I mean, they haven't really been paying their fair share. They've gotten a tax break all, the, all these years. So it's time for them to come to the table and participate in this conversation. We mix ideology and data every time we have a tax debate. It's good stuff, though. Um, I appreciate the arguments. We'll see how the whole thing pans out, and we'll follow it as we go. Thanks appreciate for having that. us. You bet. Thank uh, you. Final word, we come back. Alrighty, listen, this uh, taxation issue is complicated, and we'll spend more time on it, certainly on the radio at 3 on WPRO, you know, one day or the next. We'll have all these great reps back uh, for more discussion on this as we go. Pay attention to the Fair Shot agenda. Uh, what happened in Providence yesterday with uh, Joe Paolino's project? Some on-the-ground reaction to it tomorrow on the program, and he'll join us on Friday. Have a great night. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.